When, O oh Catiline, do you mean to cease abusing our patience? How long is that madness of yours still to mock us? When is there to be an end of that unbridled audacity of yours swaggering about as it does now? Do not the nightly guards placed on the Palatine Hill, do not the watches posted throughout the city, does not the alarm of the people and the union of all good men, does not the precaution taken of assembling the Senate in this most defensible place, do not the looks and countenances of this venerable body here present have any effect upon you? Do you not feel that your plans are detected? Do you not see that your conspiracy is already arrested and read powerless by the knowledge which every one here possesses of it? What is there that you did last night? What the night before? Where is it that you were? Who was there that you summoned to meet you? What design was there which was adopted by you, with which you think that any one of us is unacquainted? Shame on the age and on its principles. The Senate is aware of these things. The Consul sees them, and yet this man lives. Lives? Aye, he comes even into the Senate. He takes a part in the public deliberations. He is watching and marking down and checking off for slaughter every individual among us. And we, gallant men that we are, think that we are doing our duty to the Republic if we keep out of the way of his frenzied attacks. You ought, O oh Catiline, long ago to have been led to execution by command of the Consul. That destruction, which you have been long plotting against us, ought to have already fallen on your own head. What? Did not that most illustrious man, Publius Scipio, the Pontifex Maximus, in his capacity of a private citizen, put to death Tiberius Gracchus, though but slightly undermining the consul and the constitution? And shall we, who are the consuls, tolerate Catiline, openly desirous to destroy the whole world with fire and slaughter? For I pass over older instances, such as how Caius Servilius Ahala, with his own hands, slew Sporius Malius, when plotting a revolution in the state. There was, there was once such virtue in this republic, that brave men would repress mischievous citizens with severer chastisement than the most bitter enemy. For we have a resolution of the Senate, a formidable and authoritative decree against you, O Catiline. The wisdom of the Republic is not at fault, nor the dignity of this senatorial body. We, and we alone, I say it openly, we, the consuls, are wanting in our duty. The Senate once passed a decree that Lucius Opimius, the consul, should take care that the Republic suffered no injury. Not one night elapsed. There was put to death, on some mere suspicion, of disaffection Caius Gracchus, a man whose family had borne the most unblemished reputation for many generations. There was slain Marcus Fulvius, a man of consular rank, and all his children. By a like decree of the Senate, the safety of the Republic was entrusted to Caius, Marius, and Lucius Valerius, the consuls. Did not the vengeance of the Republic, did not execution overtake Lucius Saturninus, a tribune of the people, and Caius Servilius, the praetor, without the delay of one single day? But we, for these Twenty days have been allowing the edge of the Senate's authority to grow blunt, as it were. For we are in possession of a similar decree of the Senate, but we keep it locked up in its parchment, buried, I may say, in the sheath. And according to this degree you ought, O Catiline, to be put to death this instant. You live... And you live not to lay aside, but to persist in your audacity. I wish, O oh conscript fathers, to be merciful. I wish not to appear negligent amid such danger to the state, but I do now accuse myself of remissness and culpable inactivity. A camp is pitched 
in Italy at the entrance of Etruria in hostility to the Republic. The number of the enemy increases every day, and yet the general of that camp, the leader of those enemies, we see within the walls, aye, and even in the Senate, planning every day some internal injury to the Republic. If, O oh Catiline, I should now order you to be arrested, to be put to death, I should, I suppose, have to fear lest all men, all good men should say that I had acted tardily, rather than that any one should affirm that I acted cruelly. But yet this, which ought to have been done long since, I have good reason for not doing it as yet. I will put you to death then, when there shall be not one person possible to be found so wicked, so abandoned, so like yourself, as not to allow that it has been rightly done. As long as one person exists who can dare to defend you, you shall live. But you shall live as you do now, surrounded by my many and trusty guards, so that you should not be able to stir one finger against the Republic. Many eyes and ears shall still observe and watch you, as they have hitherto done, though you shall not perceive them. For what is there, O oh Catiline, that you can still expect, if night is not able to veil your nefarious meetings in darkness, and if private houses cannot conceal the voice of your conspiracy within these walls? If everything is seen and displayed, change your mind, trust me. Forget the slaughter and conflagration you are meditating. You are hemmed in on all sides. All your plans are clearer than the day to us. Let me remind you of them. Do you recollect that on the 21st of October I said in the Senate that on a certain day, which was to be the 27th of October, Caius Manlius, the satellite and servant of your audacity, would be in arms? Was I mistaken? Catiline, not only in so important, so atrocious, so incredible a fact, but what is much more remarkable, in the very day, I said also in the Senate that you had fixed the massacre of the nobles for the 28th of October, when many chief men of the Senate had left Rome, not so much for the sake of saving themselves as of checking your designs. Can you deny that on that very day you were so hemmed in by my guards and my vigilance that you were unable to stir one finger against the Republic? when you said that you would be content with the flight of the rest and the slaughter of us who remained? What? When you made sure that you would be able to seize Praneste on the 1st of November by a nocturnal attack, did you not find that the colony was fortified by my order, by my garrison, by my watchfulness and care? You do nothing, you plan nothing, you think of nothing which I not only do not hear, but which I do not see, and know every particular of. Listen, while I speak of the night before. You shall now see that I watch far more actively for the safety than you do for the destruction of the Republic. I say that you came the night before, I will say nothing obscurely, into the scythe dealer's street, to the house of Marcos Leca, that many of your accomplices in the same insanity and wickedness came there too. Do you dare to deny it? Why are you silent? I will prove it if you do deny it, for I see here in the Senate some men who were there with you. O oh, ye immortal gods, where on earth are we? In what city are we living? What constitution is ours? There are here, here in our body, O conscript fathers, in this the most holy and dignified assembly of the whole world, men who meditate my death, and the death of all of us, and the destruction of this city, and of the whole world. I, the consul, see them. I ask them their opinion about the Republic, and I do not yet attack even by words, those who ought to be put to death by the sword. You were then, O oh Catiline, at Lecca's that night. You divided Italy into sections, you settled where everyone was to go, you fixed whom you were to leave at Rome, whom you were to take with you, 
You portioned out the divisions of the city for conflagration. You undertook that you yourself would at once leave the city, and that there was then only this to delay you, that I was still alive. Two Roman knights were found to deliver you from this anxiety, and to promise that very night before daybreak to slay me in my bed. All this I knew almost before your meeting had broken up. I strengthened and fortified my house with a stronger guard. I refused admittance when they came to those whom you sent in the morning to salute me, and of whom I had foretold to many of eminent men that they would come to me at that time. As then this is the case, O Catiline, continue as you have begun. Leave the city at least, the gates are open. Depart. That manly and camp of yours has been waiting too long for you as its general, and leave the forth with all your friends, or at least as many as you can. Purge the city of your presence. You will deliver me from a great fear when there is a wall between you and me. Among us you can dwell no longer. I will not bear it. I will not permit it. I will not tolerate it. Great thanks are due to the immortal gods, and to this very Jupiter Stator, in whose temple we are, the most ancient protector of this city, that we have already so often escaped so foul, so horrible, and so deadly an enemy to the Republic. But the safety of the Commonwealth must not be too often allowed to be risked on one man. As long as you, O oh Catiline, plotted against me while I was the consul-elect, I defended myself not with a public guard, but by my own private diligence. When in the next consular committee you wished to slay me when I was actually consul, and your competitors also in the Campus Martius, I checked your nefarious attempt by the assistance and resources of my own friends, without exciting any disturbance publicly. In short, as often as you attacked me, I by myself opposed you and that too, though I saw that my ruin was connected with great disaster to the Republic. But now you are openly attacking the entire Republic.